All right, let's talk a, a little football here. Let's start in Chicago, where I would imagine Ryan Poles is extremely excited as the general manager that, that had a big hand in putting this team together, especially given where they were even a year ago. They have their franchise quarterback in Caleb Williams. He's had his up and downs in many camps and OTAs. I would imagine I care very little. Would you? Do you also care very little about the mistakes he's making at this point? Because that's sort of what you want to see. Yeah, that's what you want to see, right? Because a lot of times it's the first time these quarterbacks are getting in a huddle. It's the first time they have to spit out language on calling a play. Most of the time, when they're coming out of college, all it is is hand singles or looking over to the sideline. Now, then some of these calls can be very lengthy, and you have to be able to pronounce what the hell your the play is, so everybody in the huddle could understand. It's not only just calling uh the pass play let's say or the run play you're calling out the protection you're calling out the formation you're calling out the motions uh so there is a lot to learn and a lot to learn how to communicate that to people in a huddle then you get up there now you got a cadence that you got to worry about and it is is it on one is it on two is it a hard count and then after that then you got to execute the play and learning the offensive playbook. And it sounded like they're feeding him with a fire hose right now, wanting to get the whole offense in during his OTAs. And by doing that, you can see what he can handle mm -hmm. and what he can't handle. And how much will he be able to retain once he gets away for a little bit when you come back and report to that training camp. But on top of all that, then you got defenses, NFL defenses, that are doing crazy things on the defensive side of the ball with different disguises, with different blitz packages, where pressures are coming from. So it is overwhelming sometimes for any young rookie quarterback coming in compared to what they had to deal with in college. The other thing is, and you talked about this a lot last year, they sort of did the fire hose thing with C.J. Stroud in Houston, and then they dialed it back a little bit. So I think you you – you start off with like high level calculus and then you, you dial it back to algebra if you need to, but you see how far down that road you could get before maybe you, you feel a little overwhelmed. Because we talked in the preseason about how CJ looked like a rookie. And I think week one was the Baltimore game. Is that right? I think the uh, Ravens. Yeah. Whatever his week one game is, he he struggled a little bit. And then Bobby Slowick and CJ got on the same page and then it started to click. Yeah. Well, they dialed back the protections. This made it more simple for him to get the pre snap reads. And then more simple for him, if player A ain't open, float to player B. Yeah. And one, two, that's it. You don't have to go through this side of the field, that side of the field. And the more they get reputi repet reputations at it, the better they get at it. So, uh, But the only way you're going to learn is to throw them out there, especially during these OTAs and mini camps, and just give them as much as you can give them to see what they can retain, to see what they learn. They get this all on tape. So when you go and you have these meetings after practice and you're reviewing the film, then you can see, hey, Caleb, look at where you looked at. It should have been over to this side because the safety rotated down on the left side. Go to the right. Mm -hmm. So all the things that they didn't have to do in college or as much in college. And like I said, it's learning a whole new language. It, and the whole offense is learning a new offense because they have a new offensive coordinator as well. So that's going in. Not only is he learning, but everybody else is learning as well. So Terry and Arnold, Jackson Powers Johnson were two of your favorite interviews at the Combine. Is Caleb, he's top five probably. I think J.J. McCarthy's probably up there. I thought Caleb was <laughs> engaging. Caleb but was, yeah. I think people, whatever impression they have of him, but when you get – with him face to face and you actually sit down and talk with them. Uh, I think he surprises people because they have an impression or some kind of predetermined, this is who he is. And then when you sit down and talk with him, it's something totally different uh, than what you expected. Yeah. I'm asking that because obviously when you talk to these guys as a GM, you're spending more than five minutes with them typically, maybe sometimes not, but he was smarter than I thought. And again, that's just based on what we see on television and social media. I don't, I didn't think he was an idiot, but he came across as, as genuine. And I thought he, he was really sharp. And I was going to ask you your first impressions when you meet players, have you ever 
been so surprised that you were wrong about a player, whether good or bad? Or typically, do you have a good sense for who a player is based on that sort of interaction? Uh, you kind of have a background and yes. uh, and you have all this information on a player. So you kind of expect hmm. what's coming into your room. But I always try to, and you, you've been around me for a couple of years now, and you know how I screw around before they even come up oh, on stage, <laughs> is to get them to loosen up. I just want to know you as a person. I don't want this rehearsed robot uh, as you prepared for these interviews. I want to get to know you just as a person. So sometimes when you can screw around and me with a bad dad joke or something here or, or there. trying to tear Jackson Power Johnson's ACL with a chest bump. Yeah, well, that's his fault. He should have had a lower base. <laughs> get low. That's but true. those are the things. Yeah, you get their yeah. guard down and get to know Miss people. You're good at that. I will say, have you tried that toward the uh, towards me yet or not yet? Will you no, no, yeah. no, Waiting. no, I probably won't either. <laughs> By the way, uh, for people listening, and how watching, do you think I, I, my wife married me? I, I, that took me about six months to break through that wall. You had to turn on the, the Spielman charm on that one for long term. Well, I guess the first time I met her and told her I was going to marry her, that's not an opening line that you want to start out with. <laughs> oh, you came out hot like with that? I, I came out out the gate strong. <laughs> and that, what year in college was that? Sophomore year in college. Oh, oh, you knew it's, what was yeah, that. this Friday coming up our 37th wedding. Holy crap. How about that? Congratulations. Yeah. And I'm not uh, actually on a golf trip. So that was something that I did not see coming. I forgot. I didn't still, put the two and two together. Still got it. Well, <laughs> congratulations on 37 years. That's, if that's we can awesome. get over the 40 year hump, then I think I'm in the clear. I don't know. We'll see. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it, Rick. <laughs> don't count those chickens just yet. Congratulations, though. 37, that's a big. Uh, I'll be uh, 37 in a couple of years, as far as you know. All right, let's talk about... Uh, we're going to take a break here in a second. But first, let's talk about uh, Roma Dunce, the other first-round pick. And here's something I want to mention, Rick, because this is... I First, I want to ask you this. How would you react now in this day and age where every team has their their video unit and they're putting stuff on social media and YouTube and all the other stuff. And I know you were, had your hand in that when you were at Minnesota later, because it wasn't a thing earlier, but uh, the bears put out, or maybe it was on um They allowed it to be released. I'm sure it's something to do with, it. but Roku had a show called NFL draft to pick us in. And there's a clip of Ryan poles calling Terry Fontenot, the, the Falcons GM, the uh, bears took Roma Dunes eight, nine, the Falcons picked at eight. They obviously took Michael Penix jr. But Ryan Poles called Terry Fontenot and asked him, hey, what do you think about letting me trade up one spot? I'll give you a fourth-round pick. That's what the Bears and the Eagles had done last year in the 9-10 range because the Eagles came up and got Jalen Carter, and the Bears moved down for, for one spot to get Darnell, Darnell Wright, their starting right tackle. Terry said, no, we're good. They ended up taking Michael Penix Jr. But he was so concerned, Ryan Poles was, about losing out on Roma Dunze for another team coming up to eight. I don't think he thought the Falcons were going to do it. But would you, and he said his assistant GM, Ian Cunningham, actually talked him out of it, just said, say the course. I thought it was interesting for, for a couple of reasons. One is that if you're board set, you're board set. So why do you think he was wavering there? Or maybe that was part of the conversation we might trade up for Roma Dunze. I think those that's the part of the job that's exciting. Because oh. those are like game time decisions like a coach has to make or a player has to make on Sundays. Uh the only scenario that I can come up with, well, there are a lot of scenarios I can come up with, but my first draft, it was, do we move up one spot to get Adrian Peterson or do we sit there and let him fall to us? And uh, we were dealing with the Washington Redskins at the time. And uh, I have the ownership breathing down my neck. Oh. We wanted to get Adrian Peterson. And I was <laughs> like, we ended up holding and did not make that trade to swap up. And uh, I was like, God, if Adrian Peterson goes before we pick, this might be my only draft with the Minnesota Vikings. And it uh, worked out where Adrian fell to us and uh, the rest is history. But that's the exciting part, I would say, is that you got to know what was that Kenny Rogers song? You got no one to hold them, no one to fold. Yep. And those are the things that were the most exciting part of the job was operating on that clock on draft day, trying to go up and get a player or staying or moving back, hoping to still get the same player. Uh, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Uh, but that's what you do all that prep work for and go through all those scenarios before the draft. 
Do you remember who Washington took at number six before you yes. were in the pocket number seven? The safety from LSU. LaRon Landry. I tell you what, man, they made a mistake there, obviously, but uh, the picks that went before them, Calvin Johnson went second to Detroit, and Joe Thomas went third to Cleveland, both Hall of Famers. Adrian Peterson will be a Hall of Famer one day, and then a few picks later, Patrick Willis went to the 49ers. He's a Hall of Famer. Darrell Rebus at 14 went to uh, the Jets. He's a Hall of Famer. So uh, you got the right one. Who would you have taken if if um, Adrian had been drafted? <laughs> or oh would you have been fired already? <laughs> yeah, just been fired. <laughs> <laughs> had a good run. Mm-hmm. All right, so I mentioned that because I thought that was that was interesting, and I, I appreciate the fact that they put it out there. I don't know if Ryan Poles wanted that out there, but it's out there now. And then Roma Dunze's role, obviously the quarterback position is the hardest to learn coming in. How difficult is it to learn coming from – Caleb DeBoer runs a, a pretty pro-style offense. How, what's the transition going to be like for Roma Dunze? Um, I think it'll be because a if he's working in the slot because we've seen him in a slot we've seen him outside it depends on where they end up lining him up and what his role is especially when they went and got Keenan Allen when you got DJ Moore uh, you got DeAndre Swift you got Cole Komet so you have a bunch of different combinations so it'll depend on what kind of role that he ends up carving out for himself. And I'm sure they know how talented he is that they're going to figure out how to get the ball in his hands and share the wealth. Yeah, this this team. I mean, we've said it a bunch since the draft, but rarely has a quarterback, maybe never, come into a situation so good offensively and defensively. Like Sometimes you get a good defense as a rookie if you're Joe Flacco coming in or Ben Roethlisberger back in the day. But this offense is, is stacked too, and I think it, the transition, the expectations will be high, but I think, you but you're going to have to be patient because this okay. is a whole new offense, new offensive coordinator. Now the defense, I thought that last six or seven games when Matt Eberflus took over as a defensive play caller, that that was a top 10 defense the way they were playing. Uh, you know, they struggled early in the season. Then once uh, Coach Eberflus took over, I thought they played extremely well on defense. Now some of the pieces they added. Um, they got the corner locked up for a long-term deal. Uh, so, yeah, you know, the trade for Sweat uh, was a big trade for them. I still think they're missing an edge rusher on the other side. Uh, they yeah, made... they traded back up into the fourth, I believe, for our guy, Austin Booker. But yeah, he's but he's not ready. He's a developmental guy. Yep. So, but with this defense, hopefully can carry this team until the offense starts clicking and that may take, you know, three, four games before you really see this offense get going. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Expectations going to be high in Chicago for the first time in a, in a long time. 